Well, it's good to see everybody here this morning. I uh, thank you for the, the privilege of being able to come and to share with you today. Uh, we got to share a little bit in Sunday school about Northern Light Christian Church. We're excited about that. We, for those of you who don't know, we've been in uh, Minnesota since June and laying the foundation for a church that's going to launch in September. And so we, uh, we're feeling the, the clock tick as we move forward to, uh, to launch time. So we're excited about that. I uh, spoke to Mike, and he, he informed me that he's going to uh, be away this weekend and, and asked me if I'd be willing to come and to, to share with, about the church and then also to, to speak here on Sunday morning. And I told him, sure, and he said, we've been doing this thing called The Story, and uh, we'll be on chapter 10. And I'm thinking, okay, well, that sounds good. And uh, Then I realized after I read chapter 10 that chapter 10 is actually chapters 1 through 15 of 1 Samuel. <laughs> And I'm thinking, well, boy, Mike has one awesome congregation because he must be preaching three or four hours at a whack. <laughs> and so he said, no, we got 30 minutes. So um, we're going to try and squeeze it into 30 minutes. So in order to do that, we, we might want to pray. So would you pray with me, please? <laughs> Father, we thank you for the privilege of being called your children. We know, Lord, that uh, we're so blessed in so many ways. Uh, we see the many ways that you work in our lives, but there's many, many, many more, Lord, that we're not even aware of, and we thank you for those, Father. We thank you for this church, that we can come to a place to be with people of like mind, uh, to learn more about you, and to worship you, and to give our hearts to you. And Father, as we open your word now, I pray that you uh, would speak to each one of us. I pray, Lord, that, uh, that I would step out of the way, and that you would uh, have your way with your word. I pray these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I uh, went to my first church, a little rural place in Virginia, a little country church. And uh, the first time I went there, I went there for a trial sermon. I got there about 30 minutes early. It's just this little church out in the middle of pasture land, and uh, there's a little uh, gravel parking lot surrounding it. And so I was parked there. And shortly after I arrived there, Harry arrived on the scene. Now, Harry was in his mid to, probably early to mid-80s. Um, he was the first person I met. He introduced himself. He was very uh, wonderful, embraced us. Uh, but I learned that Harry had been sick for a real long time. And shortly after receiving the call to, to be there at the church, I was spending a lot of time going to the hospital to visit with Harry. And it became commonplace to get a call, and they would say, well, Harry's back in the hospital again. And so I'd go to the hospital, and we'd spend time together. And I enjoyed those times that we got to spend together. He always had something interesting to share. I got a call one evening, and it was like any other call. They said, Harry's back in the hospital. Would you come down? And so I arrived there. Uh, it seemed that it was a little different this time. Harry was in ICU, and he was almost on what appeared to be kind of like an, an operating table, just a hard gurney. And uh, all the family was there, and they said, uh, uh, you know, it's really bad this time. And Harry had been going through these convul convulsions. His body would just contort, and he'd shake, and he'd have these, uh, these uh, heart attacks. And it would be very violent for a period of time, and then it would, it would subside, and he could get his breath. Uh, and it just kept going and going. And he, he called me over there, and he, he was weak, and he asked me to... Uh, to stoop down, and, and so I did, and he he said to me, he said, uh, Preacher, you need to tell these people to love one another. There had been issues in the church, and he had been with the church a long time, and like many churches, they had issues, but this was a particularly volatile time, and that was his, his final concern, was that we would love each other. And I remember thinking to myself, wow. You know, I can't imagine myself being 80 years old after all this time, going through all this, and my last thoughts are, tell them to love one another. That was an amazing thing to me. See, Harry knew who his king was. And I remember thinking, wow, what, who is my king, really? What is my king? Is it, is it a big church? Is it money? Is it, is it all the boy toys? What is it in my life that is really king? And, and sometimes that's a scary thought when you are honest with yourself. And that is sort of what this 
10th chapter of the story is all about. It boils down to us honestly assessing and making a commitment to say who our king really is. You'll recall that as the story opens up in chapter 1 of 1 Samuel, that you have, um, this is a, a pivotal time in, in the life of Israel, and it opens up with uh, Elkanah, who is married to two women, Penina and Hannah. Penina was able to conceive children, she gave children to Elkanah, and uh, she was very proud of that fact. Hannah, on the other hand, uh, her womb was closed, and she was unable to conceive, and this bothered her greatly. And Penina made matters worse, because whenever she got an opportunity, she would rub Hannah's nose in it, and let her know just how um, inadequate she was, because she couldn't conceive. And this bothered Hannah greatly. Well, Hannah and Elkan Elkanah and Penina were at the temple in Shiloh, and uh, Hannah was having one of these days that just wasn't going well, and she was disturbed, and she was crying, and she, her, behavior, her, her behavior was a bit erratic. And Eli the priest notices her, and he thinks that she's drunk. And so he confronts her, and he asks her um, what is going on. And she confides in, in Eli that she, in fact, is uh, distressed by the fact that she can't conceive. And... She wanted a child so much that she promised the Lord if he would just give her a child, then she would dedicate him to the service of the Lord. It's funny how Hannah's husband tried to console her. At one point he tells Hannah, Hannah, aren't I better than ten sons? Now, Dennis, I'll give you a little bit of advice. I did a little research, and uh, I want to tell you, if your wife is feeling distressed and emotionally going through some difficult times, do not, I repeat, do not, say to her, how bad can it be? You're married to me. <laughs> not a good thing to do. I learned the hard, hard way. I assume Elkanah learned the hard way as well. But we see that uh, the Lord blesses Hannah and Elkanah. They go and they conceive a child and that child's name is Samuel, the first main character that we want to look at uh, in our text this morning. What do we know about Samuel? We know that uh, Samuel needed to be weaned. So when he's about three to five years old, uh, Hannah keeps her promise to the Lord, and she takes him up to the temple, and she turns uh, her son, Samuel, over to Eli the priest, so that he can begin to learn the ways of the Lord and, and learn how to serve Him. Now, Samuel grew up in the temple, but Eli had a couple of sons named Hophni and Phinehas. These guys were not real God-fearing men. They were using their position in the temple for personal gain. They uh, were sort of prostituting the office to, to uh, get the things that they wanted, to pursue wealth and to pursue other things. And, and this is something that Samuel is seeing. But Samuel remains true to the Lord, and, and he doesn't go the way of Hophni and Phinehas. We know that eventually uh, Hophni and Phinehas are going to be killed in battle, and a messenger is going to be sent to Eli, their father, to let them let him know that his two sons had been killed on the same day, which was prophesied. And then the thing that really puts Eli over the edge is he's told that the Philistines have captured the Ark of the Covenant. And that was just too much for Eli. He was a big guy and fell off the back of his chair and broke his neck. And that was it. Now, although Samuel was soaking up everything as a boy... It was rare to hear from God. Eli wasn't doing everything that he should be doing, so he wasn't hearing from God. And so it was just unusual. But something exciting happens when Samuel is about 12 years old. You all know the story that, that the Lord calls out to Samuel, and Samuel wakes up and he thinks that Eli is talking to him. So he runs to where Eli is at, and he says, What do you want? I'm here. Eli says, Well, go back to bed. I didn't talk to you. This happens three times. Finally, Eli gets it. He realizes that it's the Lord calling Samuel. And he tells him, go back and if you hear the Lord calling again, just stay there 
and say, speak, for your servant is listening. And that's what happens. And that is the beginning of God coming back into uh, the picture and to speak uh, to the nation of Israel through Samuel. This is an interesting time because y'all have been learning about the judges and we're sort of winding that period of time of the judges down and we're going to trans in, in, transition into this monarchy, monarchy where they want to have a king. If you have your Bibles, turn to chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 19. It says, The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. What he's saying is everything that Samuel had prophesied about came true. The Lord made sure that it did. And all of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. Well, Eli finally dies, an old man, after serving uh, the nation of Israel for 40 years. But the Bible tells us that because of Samuel, Samuel, uh, the Lord works through Samuel's lifetime, and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines. And the towns from Ekron to Gath that the Philistines had captured from Israel were restored to Israel, and Israel delivered the neighboring territory from the hands of the Philistines. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. In verse 15, it says, Samuel continued as the leader all the days of his life. See, what had happened... The Lord was preparing Samuel. Samuel becomes the, the, the new prophet on the scene, if you will. And the Lord begins to turn things for the nation of Israel. And things are going well because Samuel is leading them in the right direction. But a crucial time comes along in the life of the nation of Israel. You'll recall that uh, the Israelites had a difficult time staying on track, much the way that we do. You know, they're, they're delivered from that horrible bondage in Egypt and they just they get out into the desert and as soon as they're out there they forget that they've just been delivered and they start whining and complaining. And there's a cycle that always happens. They, they whine and complain. The Lord goes ahead and blesses them back on track and then for a period of time and then they forget again what the Lord has done for them. And that uh, is what happens here. Chapter 8 Verse 1, it says, When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders, Joel and Abijah. But like Eli's sons, Samuel's sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You're old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to us to lead us such as all the other nations have. They were giving up on God, and Samuel is not a happy camper. He's very upset that the nation of Israel would turn their back on God and ask for an earthly king. He goes to God and he begins to vent, telling God how horrible this thing is. And God has to give Samuel a little perspective and remind him, hey, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. The Lord instructs Samuel to explain to the nation of Israel what it means to have an earthly king. What the cost is really going to be. So Samuel goes back and he gathers the people together and he begins to explain to them what it means to have an earthly king. And he's going to lay it on pretty thick. He's going to tell them, we're going to, uh, this king is going to conscript your men into service. He's going to take your, your maid servants and your man servants. He's going to take all of your flocks. He's going to tax you. He's going to uh, consume your lives. Everything is going to become about him. And Samuel is hoping that the people will give up their hope of having an earthly king. But they say, we still want one. We want to be like everybody else. We want to be like all the other nations. We want our own king. So along comes the second person in our text that, that we need to look at. Saul, the first king of Israel. Saul's a strapping young man, 30 years old. A young man from Gibeah, the son of Kish. Kish was uh, a pretty influential guy. He was well respected in the community. 
Saul, however, didn't have what his father had. He wasn't as equipped. He wasn't as skilled as his father. And Saul wasn't necessarily equipped to be a king. Intellectually, he didn't have it. Emotionally, spiritually, he wasn't gifted that way. Really, all he has is he looked apart. Samuel gathers the people together at Mizpah, and he goes to introduce Saul. And first of all, they can't find him. He's out hiding in the luggage. When they drag him out from the luggage, and he presents him to the nation of Israel, that he says to them, look, he's a head taller than any of the others. There's no one like him among the people. And the people saw him, saw what he looked like, and they were right on board. This is our guy. They shouted, long live the king. The truth is, the only thing that qualified Samuel to be king was the fact that God picked Saul to be king. And when that happens, when he's anointed as king, the Bible tells us that God changes Saul's heart. And the Spirit of the Lord came on him. And we know that he would reign for over 40 years. And he had some good times during those 40 years. There were times when he was walking uh, with the Lord and he was consulting with Samuel and he was doing the right things. And when he did, the Lord blessed them. And great things happened. But eventually, the time comes where Saul's true allegiance is revealed. Who Saul's king really is, we're going to find out. Turn all the way back to Exodus. Chapter 17. You'll remember this story in chapter 17, beginning about verse 8. We know that Moses instructs Joshua to get his military men together. And they're going to go into battle and fight the Amalekites. And Moses tells Joshua he's going to go up on the hill and he's going to hold up the, uh, the, the, the staff of God in his hands. And and so he goes up there along with Aaron and Ur on top of the hill. And as the battle was waging, as long as he kept his hands up in the air, the Israelites were having success. But as he dropped his hands, the Amalekites would begin to have success. So Aaron and Ur get a rock and they set it down and they allow Moses to sit on it. And then one gets on one arm, the other gets on the other arm. And they hold up Moses' arm so the nation of Israel can prevail. It says in verse 13, So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with a sword. But what is interesting about this battle is what happens in verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it. Because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under the sun. Well, a long time has passed, and now God is ready to use Saul to do that very thing, to, to uh, remove every trace of the Amalekites from the existence of the planet. And the Lord instructs Saul in chapter 15, he says, I want you to attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put them to death. Men, women, children, infants, cattle, sheep, camels, and donkeys... Everything that has breath, he wants destroyed. Pretty harsh. Samuel, uh, or Saul, excuse me, I'm sure, um, initially was going to do that. But then something happens within him. He recognizes all the resources that the Amalekites have. He sees the people. He sees... The, 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 the crops, he sees the, the flocks, and he begins thinking, wow, these are good things. I could use these. And so instead of killing King Agag, Ag Ag, he says, well, you know, if I capture him, I can sort of parade him through the streets, and, and uh, I'm going to be elevated as king. This is going to make me look good. So he doesn't follow through on what God tells him to do. Samuel eventually is going to go to find Saul. He seeks him out. And it says when Samuel went to find Saul, he was told that Saul has gone up to Carmel 
to erect a monument in his own honor. See, we're beginning to see who Saul's king really is. Saul was proud of himself. Saul's king was prestige. Saul's king was, uh, was power, was wealth, was, was all the things that made him look good. To make matters worse, when Samuel confronts him about his disobedience, Saul tries to cover it up. When Saul sees Samuel coming, he goes to him and he says, Lord, bless you. I've carried out the Lord's instructions. Already he knows he's been caught. But Samuel says, What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answers, The soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and the cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. He's throwing the soldiers under the bus or under the chariot, I guess. See, and they went into battle and they recognized these great resources and they brought them back. But he says they brought them back so that we could sacrifice them to the Lord. And Samuel reminds Saul, he says in verse 17, Although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people. Samuel is telling Saul, look, you need to remember, Saul, that the only reason that you're king is because God anointed you king. You were really nothing. You had no business being king. You weren't qualified to be king. Saul again tries to make excuses and say, oh, we, we did this so that we could honor the Lord. Samuel says, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as obeying the Lord? It is better, is, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, the Lord has rejected you as king. This was the straw that broke the camel's back for Samuel and for the Lord. Saul would reign for another 15 years. But the hand of the Lord was removed from him. And he no longer had any contact with Samuel. When you look at the last verse of chapter 15, verse 35, it says, Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him. And the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Can you imagine Think about that. To think that the Lord would regret blessing you at some point. I heard one preacher put it this way, that he imagined the Lord walking into Walmart with Saul underneath his arm and going to the customer service desk and saying, here, you can have him back. I don't want him. He doesn't fit. He doesn't work. There's an amazing contrast that takes place between Samuel and Saul. Two people who have amazing opportunities that come at the hand of the Lord. Both experience the grace and mercy of God. These two guys had each been placed in unique situations where they could dramatically change their world. They were both to do great things for the Lord and through the Lord. These two men were, were, were tightly connected together. Yet they both had two very different kings. When you look throughout these 15 chapters of 1 Samuel, you see all kinds of contrasts. You see a contrast between Hannah and Penina. Penina was about herself. Penina was about the children that she was able to conceive. Penina was about uh, being able to make her husband happy. Hannah's king was God. She wanted a child badly. She loved Samuel when he was born, but she loved God more because he was her king. There's a contrast between Eli's son and Elkanah's son. Eli's son were in the temple. They were, they were groomed to be priests and to serve the Lord, yet they were using their position for their personal gain. Their king was, was their, their personal gratification. Their king was their, their personal pleasure. Elkanah's son was all about serving the Lord. There's a contrast between Eli and Elkanah. Eli knew his sons were wicked. 
He saw his sons doing things in the temple that he knew that they shouldn't be doing. Yet instead of dealing with his sons, he looked the other way. We know that Elkanah was a man of God. He would go up to the temple and he would uh, make sacrifices. And all that he did, he did for God. We have many preachers today, unfortunately, in the body of Christ, whose king is really the pulpit instead of the king that they proclaim from the pulpit. The starkest contrast of all is this contrast we see between Samuel and Saul. Samuel, from the time of his birth, was dedicated to the Lord. He didn't get a choice in this. His, his mom weans him, takes him to the temple, turns him over to the service of the Lord. He's to, to learn at Eli's feet. As he's growing up, he's seeing Hophni and Phinehas do these things that he knows wrong. But I can imagine he probably said to himself, time, from, uh, at least occasionally, I'd like to have what they have. I'd like to wealth. I'd like to, to, to do something for myself. But he doesn't do that. He puts God first. His whole life, he lived because God was his king. Then you look at Saul. Saul is one of these people who got to where he was because of circumstances. Circumstances that just fell into his lap. It wasn't because he did anything. We've all seen these kind of people. They're the kind of people that just seem to have things come their way. No matter what they do, they just have opportunity after opportunity uh, come their way. And, and they take advantage of that. They recognize it as God's grace and God's mercy. And they honor God by taking advantage of those opportunities and doing great things for God. That's a good thing. But then you also have people like Saul who have the same opportunities that come into their life. But over time, they begin to feel entitled. They begin to feel like they're special, that they're better than everybody else, and somehow that they're entitled to things. They become prideful and arrogant. It becomes all about them. They lose sight of how fortunate they are and how they got where they are. Paul talks to the Romans in chapter 12 of Romans, verse 3. He says, don't think of yourself yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed you. Each of us has to ask ourselves honestly, who's our king? What is it in our life that really is our king? I know that when you looked at Judges, you looked in, in uh, Judges 21 verse 25, it said, in those days Israel had no king, and everyone did what? As he saw fit. Well, you know what? Today, Jesus is our king, and there are multitudes of people who are still doing as they see fit. How about you? Will you choose to be like Samuel and make God your king? Or will you choose to be like Saul? The interesting thing about Saul is that Saul, like the fact that God could be his king, but only if it fit into his agenda. How many of us have been in that boat? Where we want to serve the Lord, but we're only going to serve him if things fall a certain way. Imagine when they talked about Samuel and Saul after they passed, they talked about them in very different ways. They talked about how selfish Saul was and about the opportunities that he blew and about how he didn't take advantage of God's of blessings on him. When they talked about Samuel, I'm sure they talked about what a godly man he was and how he took advantage of the opportunities to serve the Lord and to change people's lives. See, I pray that every day that, that I could be like my friend Herod. The world looks at Herod and they, they say, wow, what an uneducated man. But God looks at Herod and sees a man full of wisdom and knowledge. The world looked at Harry and they saw a, a poor man, a, a simple man, but God looked at Harry and saw a man who was full of wealth and very complex. 
The world looked at Harry and saw a pushover. God looked at Harry and saw a peacemaker. The world looked at Harry and saw an insignificant life. God looked at Harry and saw a life well lived. A life that touched many people. And for one reason. Because Harry knew who his king was. If you know who your king is, your life can still be transformed. If you know who your king is, you can transform lives of, of those people around you. It says in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 to 6, We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what, his command, do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. And this is how we know that we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Anyone who claims to put Jesus as their king must live as Jesus did. Anyone who claims that God is in control of their life must live as though God is in control of their lives. Everything that chapter 10 of the story boils down to boils down to this. Who's your king? You know, Elkanah chose God as king. Hannah chose God as king. Samuel chose God as king. Who are you going to choose as your king? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our King. We know, Lord, that living in this world is a challenge. Our eyes oftentimes wander. Pride takes over. We want to be like others. We want what other people have. We're like the nation of Israel who wants a king because everybody else has one. I pray, Lord, that we would turn our eyes to you, that you would be our king, that you would be sufficient for us and we would recognize that and that we would live for you, that we would recognize that you've given us many opportunities and many blessings and that we should seize those things and not be tempted by the things of the world. I pray, Lord, that if there's anybody here who hasn't made you king in their life, that they would do so. I pray, Lord, that for those of us who have claimed you as king, but perhaps have not been living that way, that you would forgive us, that you would pick us up and dust us off, and help us to start living that way again. Father, it's hard to imagine what it would have been like to know that you regretted working in somebody's life. I pray that none of us would know that feeling personally. I pray, Father, that you would bless this place, the people here, the pastors here, the elders, and all those in leadership, Lord, I pray that it would be clear who their king is. pray that they would lead in this place in such a way that others would come to know your son Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We pray all these things.